Hello and welcome to the What is Justice Roundtable discussion. If you're joining us in the live audience, you may want to turn off other programs for the best audiovisual experience. I'm Sosma Samuel Burnett, and I'm the founder and president of Global Justice. And throughout this year, Global Justice is presenting the What is Justice video series. We present weekly videos from leaders presenting their definitions of justice, as well as monthly roundtable discussions with a range of leaders representing different sectors and different generations to discuss this important topic of biblical justice. For this April's roundtable, we have a great group of panelists. And those of you that are here live, you have a chance to interact with our panelists through the question and comment section on your screen. Feel free to type in your comments and questions and we'll respond as we have time in this 30 minute broadcast. So first I'd like to introduce you to Bill Koibian. Bill is the founder and executive director of Shoulder to Shoulder. Based out of Sacramento, Shoulder to Shoulder works with fatherless youth and helps to inspire and equip them for life. We also have with us from Folsom, California, Phil Dark. Phil is the executive director of Providence World. They're serving orphans throughout the world and particularly in Honduras. And lastly, we also have with us from Washington, D.C., Jeremiah Gothrop. Jeremiah works with Global Justice, but also is a teacher with Urban Teacher Center and is currently at Jefferson. We're going to hear more about their work throughout this broadcast. Welcome, panelists. Hello. Hello. Great. Glad to be here. Great. Well, Bill, I'm going to probably start with you. So let me uh, sort of give everyone a, a sense of your background. You worked first in business, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Then you were involved with navigators and then ultimately felt led to um, start shoulder to shoulder. And so from each of these reference points, what does biblical justice mean to you? Well, biblical justice today has a lot more meaning to me than it did 25, 24 years ago when I came to know Jesus at the age of, uh, at the age of uh, 49. But today, justice is, um, in my mind, with, with coming alongside with fatherless being such, a, uh, such pervasiveness in our country, we're almost imagining 100 million people in this country either grew up or are growing up fatherless. Seeing, seeing men come alongside young boys and help to mentor them and stand in the gap for these dads that are missing in action, and having moms come along, women come alongside our moms and helping to coach them in the same thing we're trying to reach the young boys on. And I think this rings true with James 127, hmm. where uh, God says, uh, religion he considers acceptable and pure is caring for orphans and widows in their distress mm -hmm. and keeping oneself from being polluted by the world. Great. Well, thank you. And now, Phil, um, similar similar question. Um, your background is also diverse in that you were a lawyer and worked with a firm and then later was inspired to work with these orphans through Providence World. Tell us a little bit about what your meaning or reference for biblical justice is. Yeah, right. A bi biblical justice, uh, to me, and again, it, the idea of justice coming from the legal background into um, working with orphan care around the world really has, uh, the idea of justice has shifted and, and um, not shifted per se, but just really given a deep understanding of what biblical justice is. And the difference, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later, but biblical justice is um, different from a lot of the world's justice in that it's, it has an absolute, it, it is the idea of making things right mm -hmm. and to bring things into right relationship. There's actually two different Hebrew words used uh, for justice in the Old Testament. I know I'm going to hack the, the pronunciation, but mishpat and uh, sedekah. I figured exactly how to pronounce them, but um, they both are deal with relationship. One is essentially giving people what uh, they are due, mm -hmm. and the other is uh, to bring things back into right relationships. And so, again, it's making things right, mm -hmm. and that implies there is a right. And so the Bible provides those different rights in different situations. Um, but really, uh, in, the, in the context of orphan care, um, again, I'll get into that uh, in the, in later in the, in the uh, panel discussion. So. Great. Thank you. Jeremiah, you are um, both a teacher and a student in the sense that you're teaching uh, high school age students, but you're also a graduate student yourself. But at the same time, you've dedicated yourself to working with this disadvantaged communities. And from those vantage points, what does biblical justice mean to you? Uh, it was similar to what Phil was saying. There's so many 
different definitions for justice, and it really, like, what one person thinks justice is, is determined like, by their vantage point, versus what another person thinks justice is, it, it changes. But when you're looking at the biblical foundation for justice, when Phil was talking about in, like an absolute right, like a truth, I think that's one of the biggest differences. So when we're pursuing biblical justice, we have a guidebook, we have the Bible, mm -hmm. and we have God working through us, trying to get us to a specific goal. Mm -hmm. And then we have the like that greater authority to be pursuing it because we are, it isn't just our own personal opinion of what this right outcome or what the best outcome or the most fair outcome is, we've got a, a stronger authority, a stronger anointing in pursuing it. Hmm. So I think that's, the, that's for me, this big difference between biblical justice versus social justice or some other term like that. Well, and just jumping off from that point, Jeremiah, you know, one of the things that we need to distinguish is what is biblical justice in comparison to these other uh, types of justice. You know, in our society, and one of the reasons we launched this series is, is there's a lot of confusion about these different forms of justice. You know, there's criminal justice, social justice, as you mentioned, restorative justice, many other forms. Um, Phil, maybe we'll start with you. How do you distinguish biblical justice from these other forms of justice that you hear in society? Yeah, I mean, and I think I alluded to this a little earlier. Um, you say Phil, I assume, right? Not Bill? Yes, yes Phil. <laughs> um, very similar. <laughs> I, I thought so, but I just wanted to make sure I wasn't cutting in on Bill. Um, no, you got the ball, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I alluded to this earlier. I, I think the difference is justice in every other context is a moving target, depending on the culture, depending on the society. Social justice, as you've seen, is just, you know, the, the term has really taken – you know, just on a life of its own in the last couple of decades, and, and and what does it mean? Well, it just depends on who you're talking with. And as I as I talk to some people about this topic, um, back in the you know the time of Jesus and and early first century, um, feeding Christians to the lions was justice. Hmm. And you know, and so I talk to people today, and I say, if we're going to have a moving target for justice, who's to say that the trafficker in Cambodia? isn't pursuing justice. He's going to say, I'm providing jobs. I'm, I'm, I'm giving people a, a, an ability to fulfill their primal needs, and I'm helping the economy, and all these great things. And if he were to say all those things and you didn't know what he did, mm -hmm. you could say, yeah, you're pursuing justice. Mm -hmm. and when you hear what he did, you'd be appalled and say, I can't believe that I said that because, of course, that's not justice. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have an absolute, who's to say he's not right? Mm -hmm. You know, and we can have these social norms, we can have these things, but if we don't have a just, if we don't have an absolute, it really does become a moving target and in 200, 200 years. Because there are some cities in India and some other places around the world where trafficking is the way of life. The entire city from birth to death, that's what they do. Hmm. And so that, if you grow up in that, you have a completely different vantage point. And I'm not at all, don't hear what I'm not saying here, I'm not advocating for that, obviously. But if you don't have that, you know, criminal justice, again, that's based on what Congress determines is justice. Right. If you take an issue like abortion, they have completely contradictory laws on the book, both of which are supposedly criminal justice, one that legalizes abortion, mm -hmm. but the other one that says if you kill that same mother on the way over to the abortion clinic and you kill her and she has a baby inside of her, it's two counts of vehicular manslaughter. Mm -hmm. So these things are, it, again, it's a moving target that, that it, it's difficult without that absolute to say this yeah, is justice. Some excellent points. And, and Jeremiah, just sort of jumping off from that, so, you know, Phil's distinguishing biblical justice as being this absolute perspective versus some of these others that are these moving targets, to use his term, or, or relative, you know, to culture or to, uh, to history. Um, how do you see the distinction? Uh, how do you see biblical justice being different or related to these other forms of justice? Well, the, my opinion really is similar to Phil when you're talking about how whose version of justice is correct, like what you believe versus what someone else believes in. And that's like we have so many arguments and these big divisive fights all the time in politics or what have you because what one person thinks the right thing is another person thinks it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. And what really, I think, puts biblical justice into a special category is because you aren't just another, your opinion isn't just another opinion. and might not even necessarily be the opinion you want. You're basing it on something greater than yourself. Mm -hmm. You're pursuing a goal and a target that isn't just what you thought of 
one day, or what you heard someone else say. It, it has greater weight and greater authority, and it's more focused. It's not going to change. Um, like you can steadily pursue it, and I think that's the big difference. And I think some of these other forms of justice can fit in with that. So you talk about social justice, and you're trying to. So for me in my work, I'm working with students who have really tragic, traumatic events going on in their um, in their personal lives, and then when they come to an underfunded school, mm -hmm. a form of justice there is like working to uh, make sure that they have adequate. Um, um, access to education, and I think biblical justice, Jesus talking about children and um, guiding them in the way they should go, I think you can pair those together. But again, it's not just me, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's more than just what I think it could be. I can go to a source and I can get specific focus and targeted advice. There are principles behind that. Well, anything you'd like to add, how do you see this distinction between biblical justice and these other types of justice that we hear about in society? Well, it, I, I, as I listen to uh, to Phil and Jeremiah, um, they seem to be very close on the same page. And I, I guess it, I would I would look at it as it's doing right in the eyes of God. And it's um, it, to me, it's the the heart of who God is. It's the heart of His love. It's the heart of His character. And um, and um, you know, we're trying to be molded into the likeness of 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 Him. And to become one with him, and when when we do when we do what he wants us to do, I think we are carrying out his form of biblical justice mm -hmm. as we become Jesus with skin on. Sure. Well, and I I really resonate with what all of you have shared. I'm going to just sort of uh, maybe challenge us a little bit in the sense that what if we weren't coming from a Christian perspective, or what if we didn't even believe in God? How do we then access this idea of biblical justice as compared to these other ideas of social justice, you know, et cetera? Um, you know, Jeremiah, what, what do you think? You know, what would you say to someone about you know, the importance of biblical justice if they don't come from that perspective of you know, a faith-based perspective? I think you can show them that just because you are a Christian or you have believe in the Bible, that you have the same, you can have the same goals and you can work together to pursue them. Uh, it's not like if you're a Christian or you have a biblical form of justice, you just want to call down fire and brimstone on bad people. Like you, you can, if someone doesn't believe you, you can show them that there is this issue, and we both agree it's an issue, and we need to work on it. So if you find, if you can find that common ground and work from there, and then if you've got God working with you too, which is what we're all believing, you're going to have some wisdom. You're going to see some success that's going to draw people together. So I don't think it has to be a divisive thing, and you can be open and honest about it, because ultimately, whether you believe in God or not, or you understand biblical justice or not, you can, at the end of the day, be on the same page. Right. Now, Bill, um, just sort of jumping off of what Jeremiah shared, um, do, you, do you feel the same way if you're dealing with someone who doesn't come from a faith perspective or just a different faith perspective, that you'd be able to still support for them this idea of biblical justice? That for, that's for Phil, correct? That's for Bill with a B. <laughs> oh, B with a Bill. Okay. Um, well, I, I was just looking. I'm just uh, reminded of Proverbs 29:7, where he says, "The the righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern." Mm -hmm. And when we model out, we model this to people, you know, that are not believers, and they see how we're how we're providing care to to those that are less fortunate or those that are in dire need. I think we're, I think that's the best way to address that whole issue with someone who um, doesn't, doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in Jesus. Um, I don't know, what do you guys, what do you, what do you other fellas think? Bill Dark, what do you think? You know, is it a matter of modeling or is there, is there something more to that? I think I, I, it's, it's definitely, I, I agree with both in, in, in the sense that uh, we need to meet people where they are. And I think Paul models this when he goes to the Areopagus. He, comes, he goes to where people are, not just physically, but also mentally and intellectually. We need to see where are people, come to the common ground, see what we agree on first. Because, I mean, even with, you know, with non-Christians, with people that disagree with us in so many things, there's going to be a lot of things we agree on. Um, different cultures, different places we go, 
we're going to agree on a lot of things. So let's start there. And then let's figure out, okay, whatever particular area of justice, if you're talking orphan care, if you're talking, so let's take orphan care, for example, you can meet people and show how um, the fatherless and the plight of the fatherless, how the plight of the orphan actually affects them. Mm -hmm. Because most people, particularly in our backyard here in America, we don't, we don't see, you know, what we think of as the typical orphan. We, we probably, if we do see orphans, we don't even know we're seeing orphans. Sure. And to us, they don't affect our life in our mind. But they actually do in many, many ways. The part of the father list, as Bill knows, as I know, and, and as Jeremiah knows, in different contexts, affects people socially and in our everyday life a whole lot more than we ever have. Just in our taxes, because so many fatherless are depressed, are committing suicide, are committing crimes and going to prison. And, and so the, the things that happen affect us. So we can go in and talk to people and say, the need for absolutes is critical right. in our society. And, and but, to go, but again, to meet people where they are, and then to say, I understand you don't believe this scripture, but let's look at the principles behind the scripture, right? right? So, so we don't just say, this is what scripture says, therefore. As I talk to people a lot about a lot of the commandments, you know, they make sense. Sure. It's kind of like superstitions come from somewhere. You don't want to walk under a ladder. Yeah, you might get bad luck, but you just don't want to walk under a ladder. It's not a good idea. You don't want to break a mirror. There's going to be glass on the ground, mm -hmm. right? In the same way, scripture makes sense. Mm -hmm. it, when you look at, you know, again, making things right, if you go back to Eden, if you go to the last couple chapters of Revelation, that's some good stuff, right? Absolutely. That's what we want. Absolutely. So let's go and start talking to people about, here's what we're talking about. We're not going to, you know, the good, bad, bad king, bad king, bad king, bad king, bad king mm -hmm. parts of scripture saying this is what we want. We're going to the, you know, first couple of chapters, the last couple of chapters saying this is the right that we're seeking. And then throughout scripture, obviously Jesus models it for us, what, how we can come into injustice Great. and start making the right Great. relationships happen. Well, you know, I think you all articulate it well. I mean, it boils down to a sort of understanding and modeling these principles, um, these biblical principles that are, are valuable. And as you use the term, Jeremiah, where, that provide us common ground. I think that's a great way to sort of start uh, that conversation. Now, all of you have mentioned different types of justice issues. And I want to sort of circle back with you, starting with Bill Coybian. Um, Bill, if there was a particular issue of today, um, you know, internationally, nationally, what have you, that you believe is particularly important to apply biblical justice principles to, you know, what issue is that for you? Um, well, today, it, it, the word is fatherlessness, and it uh, is the root cause of almost every pressing issue facing our society today. It's responsible for 63% of youth suicides, 70% of or more of adults in prison, 71% of high school dropouts and teenage pregnancies, 85% um, of kids in, in prison, and 90% of runaways, and homeless youth, which leads to sex trafficking, uh, girls that are going to be sex trafficking. And, um, and um, are you picking up an echo? A little bit, but that's okay. Um, but I think um, this this is what my heart beats for, and uh, I'll take it off the uh, the speakerphone here. But that's what my heart beats for, Sosimo, is uh, addressing this issue and trying to get the church to understand its role in dealing with this um, this significant issue. It's bigger than any one organization. It's bigger than any one church. So we're, we're seeking to form a coalition in Sacramento of churches and businesses and nonprofits and educators and government, uh, um, um, government agencies to join together mm -hmm. to help end fatherlessness in the greater Sacramento region. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Jeremiah. What, 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 is, what do you other fellows see as the, as the biggest issue in America today? Well, and Jeremiah, I'll maybe pitch it off to you, and, and it doesn't have to be limited to the United States. I mean, you can think globally as well. Oh, sure. Uh, also be locally. But um, Jeremiah, what do you think? What's the most pressing issue in your mind uh, as it relates to this concept of biblical justice? Um, I don't know if it's the most pressing, but I know that fatherlessness and some of the problems that I'm seeing with my students, particularly male students in my school, is, is connected with fatherlessness. There's very few fathers in the lives of my students, certain classes that I've had, we've had discussions about 
like life in general. And it's really sad when every single student in the class will say that they don't have a dad. Hmm. Oh and, gosh. And that's like that's crazy. And there's so many things that stem from that. The support, the modeling of how especially young men like what what does it mean to be a man? And so they end up a lot of times in violent mm -hmm. um, encounters because they're trying to like be what they think a man should be and they see it in all these bad places. So fatherlessness and what I see in education are certainly connected. Mm -hmm. I know for me, what I'm looking at specifically with urban public school youth, it, it um, there's like two sides to it is what I've been saying. There is a funding policy side that lead that, that is how you would address underfunding, why these schools that have kids with the most needs have the least resources and the, the least equipped teachers. And there's a lot of, um, if you want to talk about like education equity, there's that side. But then even if uh, you have the schools to give kids opportunities, there's still all these social um, things going on outside of the school building that still impacts everything inside the house. Mm -hmm. And yeah. problems, this is a big one. Um, very few marriage relationships. Um, a lot of these kids end up being parents. Like your 16-year-old dad, what are you going to do? Because you're still a kid yourself. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's it's a complex combination of the two. Fatherlessness mm -hmm. is a big part of it. There's also drug abuse, and there's like the mm -hmm. list of things that are going on in these schools are, is vast and long, and it's not just like which one's the biggest issue. Like all together, they create this giant, complex, tangled. That's a great point, Jeremiah, this idea of this interconnectedness of these issues, you know, that, you know, it's almost like there's a ripple effect, you know, when, you know, when there's fatherlessness, for example, that might open up these young people to a host of other things, and then you layer in there uh, the disadvantages within society, whether it's economic, social, etc. So all of that, you know, as you mentioned, it is, is related to each other. Phil, how about you, Phil Dark? Um, in terms of not just your work, but, you know, just your perspectives on these issues, what do you feel is a key issue of today um, where we might apply biblical justice principles? Yeah, and I, I think it, it goes to both of the thing. I mean, the, the fatherlessness um, is so critical, and, you know, so much of that, there's so many reasons for it. You have poverty, you know, around the world, extreme poverty that, you know, is, is at a level that's just unfathomable for most Americans to even know. Um, you have, uh, you know, family issues where there's no model for people um, on what family actually is. Um, at the core of a lot of this, though, is identity, hmm. right? So if you go back even from the fatherlessness, why is there so much fatherlessness? Well, it's because both men and women fail to truly know their identity in Christ, fail to know who they are created to be, fail to understand that on even, you know, let's say myself who was raised in suburbia in Southern California, you know, to me to know that I am created as an image bearer, hmm. same as the child in the slums of Uganda that I visited a few years ago. We are created the same as image bearers of God, okay? Now, when you come from that identity point, whether, you know, you're in this in poverty or somewhere else, you see it as, I'm here to serve and to love others. I'm here to help everyone else flourish, as, and, and hopefully we can create synergies in the way we work together and we can help each other to flourish. But I don't come in, you know, as a, you know, with a God complex or I'm better than you because I was raised in Southern California, nor do I come in with the guilt that, oh, I need to give you everything in the world and, and live like you um, to make it right or whatever, because that's not right relationship either. Right relationship is... And I love what Andy Crouch says. Um, he says the truest um, or the best uh, test for society is whether everyone flourishes hmm. when they are using their gifts. And I'm paraphrasing, but they're using their gifts as they're intended to be used, and the rules of that society are followed. Hmm. And so when you look at that and you say, okay, if everyone understands their identity, if everyone is doing working together on these things, then the, the, the little girl grows up and understands that she is not made to just be a man's toy. Mm -hmm. She's not made to just be a baby carrier and have a bunch of babies from a bunch of different men. Um, and a man, on the other side of it, if we can disciple men to be men, they won't, they won't leave their families. They won't go and 
you know, be Johns to these mm -hmm. little beautiful little girls around the world right. that are image bearers, right? I mean, and so so I think that these these things if you keep going back, and I'm a root cause analysis kind of guy, so mm -hmm. I keep going back and back and back and back, and I mean, I know it can go even more, but the brokenness of man is an injustice that you know it's actually one of the the exam questions I've had. I may have it in the future or, or not, depending mm -hmm. on what I say, so for future students. Um, uh, I think if you ask the question, I, I, have the, I talked about the semester about if we could just disciple men to be men, it would alleviate, it would go a long way to alleviate the orphan crisis. You know, you know, some really you know Phil, oh, sorry, Phil if I, if I, I'd like to add something into what you're saying, uh, and that is, uh, according to Man in the Mirror, out of 110 million men in this country, 6 million are engaged in discipleship. Hmm. And that, six that's, that's less than six yeah. percent. And uh, I, I personally believe, as I think you're alluding to, is that that is the antidote to this whole issue of drawing men into the to become sons to our heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. And when a man is seeking that and trying to live that out, I believe he becomes the kind of husband that God wants him to be to the wife He gave him. He becomes the kind of father to the kids that God gave him, and he's, you become the servant in the community that he has in store for us. Therefore, we're carrying out his plan for us um, from from top to bottom. But uh, I, I, that is, to me, Phil, the biggest, biggest missing link in our society today is you know, the church discipling men. Bill, I, that's an excellent point. And, you know, I would add to that the fact that all of you are working with young people. And there's a lot of statistics that show that typically people who come to Christ do so before they're 12 years of age. And that's over 90 percent of people that tend to do that. And so the rest of us that come to Christ later in life, it's a very small percentage. So when you don't have godly figures, you know, whether it's fathers, mothers, uh, other family members, mentors, etc., around these youth, whether it's in the disadvantaged communities in the urban settings like Jeremiah has, or around the globe in, in the context of orphans that Phil is, you know, working with, and then or in the case of all these fatherless youth that um, that you're working with, Bill Koybin, it, it, it's a theme, right, for all of them. Now, we only have a couple of minutes left in our session. This panel time goes quickly, but I want to give you each of you um, just a little less than a minute to be able to share specific things that you're working on. So, Jeremiah, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell us what you're teaching, uh, what your hopes are in your work there at Jefferson. Um. Well, the hope is to be providing, I, I work with special education specifically, so when I'm in the schools, I'm trying to make sure that the students I work with who are several years behind are able to make gains in their reading ability so that they're as best prepared as they can be uh, for the future. Uh, that's, that's pretty much by the time a kid enters, uh, like early years, they like by like, first grade, if they're already behind with reading, they're going to forever be behind. And so when I'm working with middle school, high school age kids, they're reading at the age of five and six year olds, and they're 12. And so I'm trying to, like even if they have an education, make sure that they're able to actually take advantage of it. Great. There's not a whole lot you can do with your life if you can't read. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeremiah, for doing that, for your service. Now, Phil, you've recently written a book on the issue of orphans and pursuit of orphan excellence. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the book and what prompted you to write that? Yeah, I want to be very uh, clear that I wrote part of it and 14 other people wrote really the bulk of the uh, specifics that are critical to, basically it's a best practice framework mm -hmm. for uh, orphan care around the world on what every child really needs. And it goes to uh, the, the nine prongs, our family, education, community integration, medical dental care, nutrition, uh, psychosocial care, national leadership, self-sustainability, and spiritual formation. And I got people that are doing this work around the world to write each chapter on what you know they are doing, what's working. It's not a how-to manual. It's really a framework that says this, this is a conversation we need to keep having and keep helping each other. It goes to what we talked about earlier that we need to work together and collaborate on different things. And that really goes to what Providence exists to do, which is to, I like to say, you know, we, we, we want to be a facilitator of flourishing. We want to help others to collaborate. We, a lot of what you're doing, same similar things to what you're doing, Sosimo, but in, the, in a specific context of orphan care. And we're doing that through a podcast that we're actually going to launch 
uh, soon, um, and uh, and so we're doing it through Bible studies. We're doing it through other things that churches can use. Great, and um, yeah, so it's exciting. Thank you, Phil. Thanks so much for that collaborative effort that you're doing around this issue of orphans. Now, we only have a couple seconds left here, but uh, Bill, we want to give you the last uh, word. You know, share with us um, the impact of the work that you're doing there at Shoulder to Shoulder. Share with us maybe one story uh, of how your work has, has had an impact on a young person. Well, one young boy came up to me and he said, Mr. Corby, my, uh, my mom told me I got to get married when I get older, but she's never been married. My my, my grandmother's never been married. Um, I have two sisters, and all three of us came from a different man. What's mm -hmm. a marriage? Mm -hmm. That young man today, because of the investment of a variety of men in his life, is now a very mature young man who is uh, seeking the Lord, and um, he understands what a marriage is all about. He understands more about what it means to be a, a follower of Jesus, and um, it's been a privilege being able to invest in that young man. Mm, that's wonderful. Thank you all for being these tremendous servants um, on behalf of the cause of biblical justice. Thank you for being our panelists today. And for those of you that have been watching today, we hope you'll join us again next month when we do our next What is Justice Roundtable discussion. Thank you and God bless you.